people think about getting their technology out at scale, the key is making sure your customer can achieve the promise of the original ROI. And that's implementation. Nobody cares how good your technology is if they can't use it. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Applied Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by Terraleap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at terraleap.io. Today, I'm joined by my guest, John Bolin, who's based in the Dallas area of Texas. He's the CEO at Entouch Controls. Welcome, John. Good to have you on. Alex, thanks so much. Uh, it's great to be here today. Now, Entouch Controls provides smart building technology solution. The topic for our discussion today is really around energy management solutions for really the mid-market and enterprise uh, organizations out there. Whether those, those businesses have small buildings or large buildings, it's being able to provide better management of all the energy usage. Did I get that right? Yes. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, we're trying to make buildings much more efficient um, than they are today. So, yeah, being green has, has kind of come and gone. And I think a lot of people, some people care about it and other people say, well, everyone cares about it, so probably I should care about it. But help me understand <laughs> fr from really like the, I guess it's the, the person you speak to is the, the building manager or the, the building, mm -hmm. what's the title or role usually? In these you know, typically we're, we're engaging with facilities managers. I mean, we are the leader in energy management solutions for multi-site operations. And typically you've got um, a really harried leader of facilities for hundreds, if not thousands of locations. And that's the person who our message resonates with most. Of course, they're always trying to satisfy the CFO or the COO, but- yeah, There's always the people above the you, they gotta make happy. But they're, exactly. they're the ones that, that are having to worry about all the, the buildings that they're managing. What is, what's the real pain though? Like, well, what, are they, what are they facing day to day that you're seeing constantly and hearing over and over again? Well, it's, it's, it's really twofold, right? They've, they've come to be under a lot of pressure to um, reduce their energy spend and have an impact on uh, whatever their organizational organization sustainability goals are, but they also have to drive prof, prof, uh, profitability. So, so ultimately we One, create a punch. <laughs> exactly, right? So, um, you know, we reduce energy consumption and we increase operational efficiency so we can increase site profitability. And then we like to say, so that we can save the planet one building at a time. Saving the planet one building at a time. Mm -hmm. The this concept of of being able to cut costs. I mean mm -hmm. that that's all, that is either you, either the business makes more money, uh, or or you you reduce costs. I mean, both need to be happening okay. at the same time. And and for someone, I'm trying to put myself in, in a, a building facility manager's role, and their whole focus is then reduce costs, reduce costs, reduce costs. I mean, there's only so far you can go. So it's like, what well, is it like? All right, I, I've reduced costs as much as I can, and, and that's it? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really great question because um, the folks who lead this part of, the, of our customers' businesses are faced with, you have to do this less expensively, you know, day over day, week over week, year over year, but oh, by the way, do not interfere with our customer experience. And so- but keep, they, keep everything fantastic and amazing, just make it cheaper, make it cost- exactly. Exactly. And so historically, what you see, especially with HVAC infrastructure, is this sort of misguided approach where we just run it to failure. Right? As long as it's kind of cool and kind of comfortable, we really don't want to spend too much money. So we'll just wait till it really breaks. And what we're really doing is wasting energy because it's inefficient before it breaks. And then when it breaks, the customer experience is horrific. Right? Imagine in Dallas in the middle of August, if your favorite shop or restaurant loses the ability to keep it cool, um, that customer experience is very memorable for all of the wrong reasons. And so if you're using data to one, limit your energy consumption while you're using that equipment, but also monitor the equipment for performance, you can actually get in front of that. And it doesn't have to be a catastrophe when it fails. So it, 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 it's kind of the looking forward approach of, it will be cost us less if we can plan for that, but it's in the moment. But do the, as a facility manager, you just said earlier, you're having to report to your CFO, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at capital costs, I, I can imagine it's, how do you show that the value is there? Is, is it very straightforward or is, is that part of the pain and problem? It's like, it's hard to calculate 
um, that capital costs and making efficiency choices today? Typically, so, so a couple of things, right? So one, especially when you think of sustainability solutions, we all always tend to think that this means I'm sacrificing, right? I, I, in order to be more green, I must be sacrificing something. I have to give something up. I have to take one for the team. I have to use my moral compass to improve, uh, improve the planet. The reality is on energy savings alone, typically the implementation of our solution will pay for itself in less than two years. On average, across our portfolio, our, our solution pays for itself in 18 months. We have some customers that are paying for the implementation of the solution in, in seven months. Um, and that's, that's just on energy reduction alone. It doesn't include the operational savings that follow from the implementation of our, our solution. The CFO tends to want to look, though, at an energy bill for year one and compare it to year two and say, yep, I can see the reduction in energy and therefore it's paying for itself. Now, for you guys, your approach to this, mm -hmm. no, no, let's not get into the, the whole how just yet or all the features right. and bells and whistles, but how are you addressing this problem? You know, we, we address this problem by putting, you know, what I would consider the, the most impactful and feature rich control solution in a building um, in the space. But more importantly, the way we perceive it is by doing that, we're converting, converting the building to a data generating object, right? We are allowing that infrastructure to talk to us, share with us how it's performing, so that we can help you make better decisions about how you manage the building from a comfort perspective and how you manage the infrastructure of the building from an operational and maintenance perspective. I'm just gonna take a moment here. He's turning the building into a data- uh, A data generating object. A data generating object. I mean, we've heard about buzzwords like IoT right. and, and big data and all this forever, it's boring. But mm -hmm. I like this, this visual of, all right, we just need to turn this infrastructure, this, this item, this asset that we have, and it just needs to tell us more information. We need to understand what it's feeling, what it's thinking. And that's really what, I guess, this future of, of smart buildings or the, of being that's able right. to, to be efficient and make things more green, you have to have the data to work with. So that's basically how you're trying to address the problem. Is, Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, and we see that as the critical first mile, right? The, if you want to really deliver on the promise of IoT, then somebody has to put in the first mile to get the data. And you, you we can have all, that yeah. you actually have to connect to it, right? It's not, it's not a, then a miracle occurs. You actually have to put building controls in, in order to understand what the building needs you to do. What's the adoption though? Like, I am curious of, of statistics. When you look out there, like I'm not a building management facilitator, but I'm trying to see, are all my peers already, do they already have adopt this? And now I'm just trying to choose which one, or is it, is it, it's still in the early phases. You know, it, it depends on who you speak to, and, and but but building technology is really in sort of a 2.0 or 3.0 phase, right? So in the early days, you know, a number of people put in some semblance of controls that allowed them, I'll say sophisticated localized control. And then there was a wave of um, controls that allowed you sort of, you know, I'll just call it over the wire kind of control. But, but if we, you know, for those of, us who are old like me, what that meant was polling a building, right? You know, and and so the, the younger folks in your audience probably don't remember things like modem pools and servers and communication servers that just did outbound calls and pulled data back. And somebody relatively manually had to make sure that that, that took place. That generations of, of controls actually created some real skeptics, right? Because the vision was the same. Oh, we're going to make this seamless. It's that we didn't use words like the cloud, right? But we were, we were certainly on the front side of the internet and it's gonna be so easy because all of this is gonna be managed centrally. And the reality was the promise of those solutions was never fully realized, right? So I, I would tell you, you we, we see two audiences, right? So we see a, a group of people who believe they've adopted this, but they have a, a, a relatively negative experience because they adopted maybe call it 10 to 20 years ago. So we're talking a couple of decades then there is still a huge green field because of that, right? So you have a group of folks that I think I've already done this and it really didn't play out the way I thought it would. And then you have a, a, a second group of people who are looking at those skeptics saying, I don't want to get burned like them. And I need, I need a solution that will pay for itself. I, I, you know, they all remember the toughest story, if you will. And they think, I, I don't really want to have that conversation internally with my leadership. I don't want to be the one who has a failed implementation. And, and, and it's really important for us to realize that only just now 
are these managers being asked to manage the cost of energy and energy consumption on their P&L? Prior to, I would say, the last 12 to 24 months where it's really become in vogue to drive this, we were asking people to take responsibility to reduce an expense that they weren't being held accountable for. So the risk to them of not reducing it was high, right? Energy was a fixed expense. Nobody, nobody took me to task if I was spending too much. It was just assumed that's how much it cost. But now so with gonna, empty offices and things and people are like, all right, what's going on here? Why are you not trying to cut the cost? Correct. And we're seeing increasingly in the investment community, this real drive towards what we call ESG investing, right? So which is um, environmental, social and governance issues and huge investment firms like BlackRock are telling their portfolio companies if they don't um, materially move the needle on those topics, then they are going to withhold investment funds and they're going to start putting people on boards who are making decisions so, to- So it's coming from top down now. It's like, all right, what's, show me the data. How are, how are we being more green? <laughs> exactly. And, and the benefit to solutions like ours, as I said before, is because the payback is so significant, you get to achieve those goals without having to pay what people call, and, and Bill Gates in his latest book calls a green premium, right? The, I'm gonna pay more in order to, to demonstrate that I'm saving the planet. Um, that's asking a lot of a business whose primary responsibility is fiduciary to their investors. You know, we have a, a solution that when implemented has a very impressive payback and achieves your sustainability goals. You do not have to choose one over the other. This is a smart business decision that also, if you will, checks the box on your sustainability checklist. Let's let's take a, a change gears a little bit. I, I want to sure. know a bit more about the story here of, of mm-hmm. the beginnings of InTouch Controls and, and when, when you joined on as CEO, what Absolutely. was the year uh, InTouch uh, in Controls started exactly? InTouch was founded in 2008 by a handful of telecommunications and power management engineers, folks that came out of you know, like Lucent and some other organizations that, that we may all remember sort of in the, the early aughts were sort of these high-flying organizations. And, and the, the, the founders had this vision that they were going to be able to create, I'll just call it a widget that was going to control and, and um, I'll just say very dumbed down if I can, um, terms, the thermal capacity, which doesn't sound very dumbed down, does it? Or thermal envelope of a building because they thought residential solar was going to be a big thing. And on their journey, what they actually built was an incredibly robust commercial HVAC control. And so they built this widget and with one of their other founders realized, okay, that word salad we just said about what we were trying to do doesn't seem like the right direction. We've actually created in simplest terms, Nest for business, the Nest thermostat for business. And they they embarked on this journey of convincing people to buy the widget. I was asked to join in 2013. I joke now, Alex, that I was I was asked to join as the adult in the room, right? So a group of founders, they needed um, someone who had, who had scaled businesses before and in particular scaled the managed service before. So I joined, I was asked to join in 2013 to help scale the managed services side of the business because apparently commercial entities didn't just want the widget. They had no idea what to do with the commercial thermostat. Um, is this a programmable thing? I can go, I could just order something from one of these big, big companies that I'm aware of, you know, maybe it's Honeywell or Johnson Control. I just put that on the wall. I just tell someone to program a schedule. What does this really do? And what we needed was one, to educate people on the cloud um, suite of applications that we use to manage all of the data, but two, to do it for them. Because the reality is this DIY mentality in the commercial space um, where I'm just going to go buy a bucket full of stuff and I'm going to put it in and things are going to work out okay. It, while, while many organizations, especially multi-site organizations, have the technical capacity to do that one time, they don't really have the operational capacity to manage that a thousand times. So if, you, if you're operating 1,600 locations, right, and you need this solution across all 1,600 locations, you need the ability to identify the right solution, deploy the solution, and then manage the solution. We've built a vertical solution that does all of that. So part of my journey was building that out. And so when I joined our, our customers at the time were folks like Chuck E. Cheese and JCPenney's and Pizza Hut. You know, over the years, we added 
some very interesting brands, whether it's, you know, Lowe's Canada, FedEx Office, and, and other relatively large organizations. And as we scaled the business, um, I was fortunate enough that our shareholders came to me in, in, uh, in, in 2019 and asked me to, 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 to take over running the business. And so, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, while it's been an interesting journey, um, we've seen um, really exceptional growth and profitability and revenue. Um, and excited to say that right now we're the best at it in space. This this journey from taking a uh, a widget for originally meant for solar home solar to then I like your your analogy of a nest for business to then realizing wow we don't even know what to do with this all right let's create a full service solution uh, you make it sound so um, pretty uh, like right. it was okay d- d- great touch point A then then to point B and then milestone seven. What were some of the the hardest milestones or, or or things you had to overcome that that you can can look back and say, wow, we were able to to uh, get over that? No, it's a it's a it's a great point. I'd, I'd say um, two things. One is credibility, right? So, you know, at some point in in every sort of early stage growth company's um, uh, journey, you're just two guys in a garage, right, or ten guys in a warehouse, right, whatever. But but. Um, you are communicating to billion dollar organizations and they, and they need to make a bet on you. And so in the, in the very, in my very early days, it was convincing these organizations like Chuck E. Cheese and JC Penney's that we could deliver for them. Right? But that was hard. It, 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 it's very challenging because, you know, they, they have a tendency to say, this is really neat, but we're going to put you out of business, aren't we? Like, you're not going to be able to do this. We're going to be so demanding. Mm. And so, you have to get to a point where you create credibility. And what that means is in some cases with an early stage company, it's student body, right? And we have to make this happen for this customer because they have to be referenceable. So, so the, first, the, the first hurdle is organizational credibility that you can actually deliver for these large organizations. Now we did that with the second hurdle, which is the, the ability to implement your technology at high velocity and high quality. So when I joined, I come from a background where I deployed technology, techni- technology-enabled business services in the multi-site space for, unfortunately for me, because I'm an old guy, decades. And, and so what I knew was it doesn't matter if your technology works, really doesn't. Everybody's technology kind of does what they say it does. Right? So if you, if you rewind to the late 90s, when everybody was implementing ERPs from, from SAP and Oracle, you could find for every article of somebody adopting SAP, you could find an article about SAP implementations failing. And that's not because SAP didn't work. It's because it was implemented incorrectly. And, and the reality is most everybody's technology works if you implement it the way they envision you to. It's the job of the technology provider though, and my space to make sure you do. So when I first joined Entouch, my first week, one of our founders was actually on the roof of a building implementing our technology. And I said, this feels not scalable. Like if, if, if one of the founders is doing the install, this is not scalable. And so we embarked at that time on building out technology that supported the implementation, not just all of the neat stuff I talked about making the building smarter, but a mobile application that walks a third party installer through the installation of our app a centralized commissioning tool that allows an Entouch employee to integrate with that application, see the data coming off the site in real time and photographs of the install in real time so that they can approve the install before someone ever clears the site. So it's like creating that, technology for the actual implementation of your technology was needed. Technology and process. A- absolutely. Be- because to get over the credibility hurdle, we had to prove we could deploy at scale. So you know, by the time we get to you know, a 1600 site implementation in 2018, we deployed the entire thing in 20 weeks. And we did it with virtually no go backs using our own technology and using a half a dozen subcontractors in order to, to manage the nationwide footprint for which we had to implement. That to me was the most critical component as people think about getting their technology out at scale. The key is making sure your customer can achieve the promise of the original ROI. And that's implementation. Nobody cares how good your technology is if they can't use it. It has to work for them to, to then care that how great, how great it is and, and use it. Right. 
for that is a powerful uh, test. So part of it then is is that that growth of the people can they actually use their technology, but then it's the mm-hmm. team because it sounds like to be able to execute how, going from 10, 10 guys in the garage or warehouse. Right. How, how big is your team today? We're about 40 people today. That's great. So when you think of both the lessons learned here and in, in previous roles, what would you say is, okay, we always look at your, what was your best circumstance of your best hire? But I also like to ask, like, what was the worst, worst hire that you learned a good lesson from? Wow. That's, um, that's tough, right? So, because the best ones are, are super easy. I think the, um, the two things I would say, and I, uh, it's tough to single out a worst hire because we all make mistakes. Um, one, on the best hire, the, the key to hiring anybody is setting your ego aside and recognizing that your job is to always add people to the organization that make you smarter, that solve problems better than you can. The moment you fall into the trap of, I know better, I just need bandwidth, you've already lost. It, it, you, you've already lost. And so I would say the, 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 the corollary to that, and I'll say the worst hire at times, as we have scaled, and this is going to sound somewhat tongue in cheek, but a little, the worst hire can be me, right? Because as we've scaled, I've had to give things up. And I can tell you that I've got folks in my organization right now that are times are like, look, we get it. We get you used to do this, but you got to let us do it. And so at times the worst hire is yourself. Because you have to figure out how to get comfortable with giving somebody else responsibility for something you've done before. So as you scale, you have to give up certain tasks. What did they you, won't. Go ahead. What do you say to yourself to get yourself out of that mode of, well, I, I could, but, but I think I do it better, don't I? Like, what, what do you say to you? How do you, how do you create that transition the, for yourself? I think the, again, twofold. One, if you want to achieve the goals you have for the business, you can't do this anymore. It doesn't matter if they don't do it like you. You can't do this because you, you often, and I, in the beginning, as I took over the entire organization as CEO, I had to get past the idea somehow that I thought I did it better. The reality is I did it differently. And doing it differently doesn't make it better. And so, so we you really have to, what I continue to tell myself is, is it just different or did I do it better? And, and what I've learned to do, and, and I, you know, as we've grown, we've brought in really great leaders. I've got a, a, a fantastic CFO that, that I've been able to bring in over the last couple of years and, and a leader of our sales and marketing organization. And what you have to realize is if you're going to convince someone who has the capability to lead, and it and achieves that make us smarter and make us more intelligent, you have to also realize that you're giving up a piece of your own control, that they're not joining you just to, to show you fealty. They're joining you because they want to be part of the team that's on the journey with you. And, and nobody wants to carry your bag. And, and so for me, what I've had to learn is let them carry their stuff, you carry yours and recognize that Yes, you used to be the person with the GPS and the map, right? And, and sometimes you have to hand the GPS to somebody else. And, that, and just, just like when you're, you know, you're driving home and you hit home on the GPS in the car and it starts to route and it gives you three choices and they're all, they all say 27 minutes, right? No one is better than the other, right? Let them pick. And so that... I think therein lies, you know, the worst hire sometimes can be you if you don't know you're the problem. I, I love the, uh, the the complete circle there uh, that you've made. This concept of, of being able to have a good team, be able to let them grow, also comes to with technology of, of being able to implement it. Sometimes you actually bring on people that know more than you or vice versa. Actually, as a vendor, you may have to rely on someone else. Right. A technology adoption, just kind of changing the, our gears a little bit. Do you see it? There's um, kind of a pushback from the building management or whatever of, of adopting new technology. Yeah, let's let's do it. Is it all all for it, or is there kind of a, a reserve? Because of you know, it it it's funny. I, I honestly, I think it falls on generational lines, right? And I, it sounds bad, but the the longer someone has been in position. And, you know, a little bit, and I, I, I know I just described that I'm kind of this way in my own company, right? 
there's a little bit of the get off my lawn mentality, right? Which is, yeah, we do this. We do that. Um, the, I'd say the folks that come at facilities management with a, I'll just say a, a fresh perspective, a data-driven perspective, and are comfortable with technology, they tend to be at the other end of the spectrum, which is why aren't we using data to do this? Why would we possibly um, do this as manually as we used to? Why would we rely on the store managers to try to figure out what's wrong with their equipment? So it's the data that really makes their job so much easier because it, it, it's like you can't you can't deny <laughs> versus we, we just really need this because there's there's problems or there's issues. But like here's exactly the... and crossing the chasm from get off my lawn to using the data is sometimes hard if your organization isn't with you or you don't have an advocate to help you cross the chasm mm -hmm. within your organization. Right? You might have all the religion in the world. But you need someone to you need someone to help you kind of make that happen internally. So uh, talking about kind of the a little bit more of the technology, but also the future of the space, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. technology continues to advance. I mean, it started with you said for you guys creating this um, nest for 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 commercial use. But it's really how do we create buildings to provide more data off of it so mm -hmm. we can create smart choices? What do you see both what you're excited about, maybe something that you guys are working on right now or have just sure. recently released? And then also, I want to talk about the future overall, the industry, but specifically for you guys, um, what, what you are know, you excited about? What, what we're most excited about is, you know, I'll say um, predictive analytics, leveraging machine learning um, in, a, in, a, in a really precise and surgical way, right? I, I think that's to some extent been the holy grail with the data that we use in, in the built environment, um, but being able to really predict failure relatively precisely so I can invest in advance of the catastrophic failure. You know, so how do I, how do I, and, and today I'm pretty good at telling you, I think that particular piece of equipment is bad. What I want to be able to tell you and what we're working on now, and we are, are in the process, I'll say of releasing, just, I'll just say later this year, is, is not only do I know that that unit is underperforming, but I believe this component on that unit is going to fail within this time frame. Oh, wow. And, and, and that is the holy grail in the space. We are in the, our first iteration of training uh, a, a model that will allow us on a particular set of components to predict it. And we have nine business cases, if you will, nine models lined up behind this that we are then going to train. And so that we, we can tell you today when we tell you we think it's going to break, too often you say, ah, let's see if it breaks. What I want to be able to say is that not only is it going to break, but this piece is going to break and it's going to break in this time frame. You painted an, a fascinating future where you'll just have your budget planning for the next year. Say, all right, we already know what's going to break. This is the, the, the cost that's going to come up versus a retroactive. All right, this is what happened last year. So I guess we'll probably need to have X next year. You already know what's going to be happening. With that's right. That's the, that's the vision. That's the vision. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully not, not, too, not too far away. No, no. We're, like I said, we're training the first model now. So just kind of just, just for fun, looking ahead. Um, mm -hmm. if you could wave a magic wand and have any kind of futuristic technology uh, in existence in this space for you, uh, what, what would you, you like, man, I could just have X. You know, well, well, certainly it's, um, the models that I'm describing now, but in addition to that, the constant optimization of the building using, um, both machine learning models and then just say AI that's also looking at say weather patterns and recommissioning buildings almost on a 24 hour cycle based on outside weather and adjusting how those buildings are gonna to perform to maximize comfort and minimize energy consumption for those buildings. And, and then in, you know, in, in the perfect world, right? If you, start to, if you start to go out farther and farther sort of in concentric circles, you know, we're, we're relatively focused on individual, the, the built environment and, and HVAC lighting and, and other infrastructure control. You know, in the coming years, what we're going to see is the, the energy grid's going to look different, right? We're going to have, you know, microgrids, right? Buildings are going to have generation capacity and storage capacity. So we're already seeing that where large footprint buildings can afford to put local generation and local storage. And, and really, um, you start to uh, decentralize the power grid, if you will, different than, than we, we currently think about. And so, you know, we've got to also have the ability 
to manage that consumption and understand are there opportunities for us to put energy back on the grid? Are there opportunities for us to manage this building slightly differently? Um, as you look at all of those microgrids in a, in a more macro level, um, how do they put energy back out into the communities and when do they need to draw energy? And I mean, it, it starts to get really much more complex and I see Entouch as being a key part of that ecosystem as it evolves. I'm fascinated with with the energy creation, and that's probably mm -hmm. a, 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 the future of that combination mm -hmm. of microgrids and being able to more sustainably. Do you think that every uh, building could eventually just be self sustaining? Could we ever get to that point, or is it is it going to be a still always an ecosystem of just large power plants and then just providing efficiency? I I think um, you know it's funny. One of my favorite Hemingway um, novels ends with. Uh, the quote, it's, it's pretty to think so. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to think that we could get there. I think there are so many um, constraints, political and infrastructure wise, that would actually allow us to get there. It's going to be hard. I do think we will get to a time though, when all new builds are trying to drive towards um, uh, a zero carbon standard, which we're kind of already there for at least zero carbon, um, but to be self-generating and self-sustaining, um, I do think that that starts to become very real, right? The idea that you can do that today, it, that is not far-fetched, right? But very, very relatively large facilities and campuses can be self-sustaining and, and, and create a microgrid environment today. That is not science fiction. Uh, whether every building could be completely self-sustaining, um, I think is, is a little bit more science fiction um, than we want it to be. But I do see a time, I mean, when you think about the, the, the cost of generating a kilowatt hour of electricity with solar and wind right now is, is below fossil fuels. And so, you know, we're at a point where you could see every new build, you know, maybe it's a decade from now, right? Where, where every new home goes up with solar shingles and a wind generator uh, and, and has the ability to offset call it 70 or 80% of their energy. The challenge we have with renewables today is that um, because wind and, and solar are reliant on weather patterns, that you also have to have a local storage solution or some other alternate energy solution to offset um, the lulls. Now, the reality is we, we, we are closer to that, but storage capacity on municipal is scale is still an issue. Um, I also think, and, and you know, for another podcast, in order for us to really achieve that type of um, uh, zero GHG um, kind of net zero um, goal, we're going to have to see a lot of investment at both the, I'll say, political level and the private sector in new forms of nuclear energy, right? If we really want to see um, uh, and achieve um, net zero carbon, then we're going to have to explore something other than wind and solar. Wind and solar are fantastic. And I think we've seen huge inroads and they, have, they are a tremendous part of the equation. But, um, but there's, a, I, I think- enough because of the weather. Exactly. I do think over the next several decades, what we'll see is quantum leaps in, in how we use and manage nuclear energy. And that, that will change the game too. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form that somehow we're going to we're going to have localized nuclear power plants. Um, but I do believe um, we are going to see some, something akin to what you described, which is buildings that are, that are individually sustainable. I think um, different forms of renewables and nuclear energy could, could create opportunities for communities and regions also to be locally um, uh, um, sustainable. You, you paint a, a fascinating future. And also you mentioned mm -hmm. the, the roadblocks that are in the way, but right. what was your, your Hemingway quote? Wouldn't it? it would, it's pretty, it's pretty to think so. It's pretty to think so. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much John, for both sharing the, the story for and touch controls and what you guys are doing and the future uh, when it comes Absolutely. to energy consumption. Uh, for those that want to learn more, you can go to and touch controls. That's E N touch controls.com. And thanks again for your, your time, John. Good to have you on. Oh, thanks so much, Alex. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. And we'll see you all on the next episode of Uptech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know. Mm -hmm.